If you're in need of a horror film palette lens, then you need not look any further. Let's delve into why Nicholas Pesk's The Eyes of My Mother is without a shadow of a doubt, nightmare fuel. Every contemporary horror meets at a fork in the road. 95% of directors go down the same route. It's familiar, it earns money, it offends as little people as possible, and it requires very little creative effort. But there is another route that very few directors choose to stumble down, and it's in the opposite direction to the first. 2016's The Eyes of My Mother bulldozes its way down this route and takes no prisoners doing it. No pun intended. The plot is downright weird. For a runtime of 76 minutes, we're static in an isolated location at a farmhouse. Francisca is a young girl who is taught anatomy by her retired surgeon mother. We see an example of this where mother demonstrates how to skillfully dissect a cow's eye. But more importantly, mother's teachings are to instill the principle that life and death is something natural and there's nothing to be feared. One afternoon, a mysterious man named Charlie appears at the farm and is let into the house by mother. Once inside, it's clear clear that Charlie is completely deranged and he ends up killing mother in the bathtub, hacking her to death. The psychological damage that this causes Fran is deep rooted and is a catalyst for what is to come. Pesk's directorial debut understandably received a polarising reception from audiences at 2016's Sundance Film Festival and it's at this point that I knew why. First of all, it's shot in black and white. Why? Well, there's several reasons for this. It achieves an organic, rough around the edges look which, coupled with the plot of this film is a perfect stylistic choice. Additionally, black and white is symbolic of contrast and it was incorporated by Pesk to emit undertones of life and death and how quickly somebody can cross over to the other side, which is synonymous with mother's teachings or how quickly one's psyche can change like the flick of a switch. Something else I noticed straight away, pay close attention to the narrative structure used at the beginning. Pesk opts for reverse chronology, or where the final shot of the film is used as the opening shot. Look at the lane dividers on the road, straight as an arrow, linear. Again, this is intelligent symbolism. The path ahead is as twisted as you can possibly imagine. It's anything but a linear route to come in full circle. The subtle drops of foreshadowing are masterful in this sense. As mentioned, a man called Charlie arrives at the farm and begins to speak with Fran giving off the impression of a sleazy salesman. Mother's maternal instincts kick in when she sees him speaking alone from the window. Charlie comes off as a genuine, charming and friendly person from the outside and asks to come inside of the house to use the restroom. Mother gives him general directions, but his demeanor instantly flips into something more sinister. Could you show me the way? We can try this one more time before I start to become unreasonable. With a sinister smile, frizzy jester-like hair and obvious psychopathic tendencies, Charlie pulls out a gun and asks Fran to sit on a chair in the corner and to be quiet. His father pulls into the drive and enters the home. We hear sounds of breathlessness coming from the bathroom. The camera pans in and Charlie's just hacking away at mother over and over and over. And then the camera pans away extremely quickly, which is quite odd from a viewer's perspective. Fran's face is just pure confusion. You can see the synapses in her brain just short-circuiting, unable to process or compute something that no human is ever meant to witness, never mind a child. And as for the nightmare fuel that's yet to come, well, this is our epicenter. This is where it can all be traced back to. There's an interesting technique used by Pierce throughout the film, which takes place in the following scene. Once father comes home and finds Charlie hacking his wife to death, as an audience, we anticipate a conflict, a struggle, a fight scene. But the film completely misses this out and fast forward to Charlie lying on the ground, knocked out. There's no scream from father, no struggle between him and Charlie as he tries to exact revenge on his wife's killer. Many horror films would be foaming out the mouth to make a meal of this, to accentuate the action. But what Pest does brilliantly is he relies on the intelligence of the audience to simply fill in the blanks. We see the aftermath, not the conflict, and that itself is jarring to watch, and it creates hysteria around what's just happened. Father locks Charlie in the family barn, and after a few days go by, what happens next is truly unsettling. Fran goes to visit Charlie in the barn, who's now incapacitated capacitated and shackled to the floor after Charlie is repeatedly shouted She questions Charlie, why us? Why did you attack our house? To which he responds, because he let me in and it feels amazing. 
Fran then goes on to say she's going to take care of Charlie because he is her only friend and then proceeds to cut his eyes out and sever his vocal cords. Again, it's a jump cut that's used here and we see the result, the conclusion of a horrific event, but the film skips the preamble. There's no blood curdling screams, it's just so calm and that's horrible to watch as a viewer. It makes you feel uneasy because it's such an unnatural reaction from the victim compared to what we anticipate. Fran goes back to sitting with her father who hasn't move from the couch watching the TV and says he won't make any noise anymore. I love you daddy. I'm sorry, what? It's clear that the events which Fran's been a part of have significantly impacted her. She's a full-blown psychopath as a child but what's interesting is the anatomical references to her mother are still there. She takes his eyes and voice box with precision using a surgeon's instruments. I've mentioned in other Nightmare Fuel installments that the eyes are the windows to the soul. And again, this applies here. She's taken his soul. Charlie effectively becomes Fran's pet. It's really bizarre. I mean, she catches a rat and then she feeds it to him and he's grumbling on the floor like a dog whilst resting on her lap. I go as far as saying he's enjoying it. There's no struggle, no attempts to leave. It's a case of Stockholm Syndrome here and that's pretty much set in straight away. Although he took mother from Fran in the most brutal of ways, she's taken on the role of a mother-like figure to Charlie. The film then jumps forward to chapter two where Fran is now an adolescent. Her father's dead in bed behind her and what she does with his body is just disgusting. She carries him to the bathtub, begins to bathe him and then proceeds to get inside behind him while continuing to cleanse his corpse. She then gets him out of the bath, puts him next to the TV and his head's just snapped back. A nice little reference there to 1974's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Fran then decides to dance her troubles away and heads out to to a local establishment to blow off some steam. She brings back a woman to a house to effectively have a one night stand with her, but after asking too many questions and finding out she killed her father, the scene jumps forward again and the woman's already dead. This has happened enough times now to condition the audience to preempt something bad happening to any character that comes on the screen. For example, towards the end of the film, Fran's carrying a baby and when myself and Connor were watching this, we both went, oh no, 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 no. It's clever script writing. It's syncopated in its style in comparison to cookie cut contemporary horror that follows the same scripted patterns that we've become accustomed to over the years. Disappointed that she hasn't got any action from her latest victim, Fran leads Charlie upstairs and begins to undress him. It's this kind of plot line that just makes me feel so uncomfortable. This is the person that's butchered my mother. I've then incarcerated him in chains in the barn for the last eight years and now I'm going to rattle him like a set of broken maracas. It just doesn't make any sense man. You can't predict anything in this film and that's why it's nightmare fuel. However, she does then dispatch of him after he attempts to make a poor escape immediately after this, again because he's got absolutely no vision or idea of where he's going. Losing her mind, Fran ends up walking through some woodland and decides to hitchhike back home with a mother and child. Upon arrival, she makes a request to hold the child, to which the mother politely declines. Fran then insists and immediately makes a beeline for her house, holding the child, and stabs the mother and then shackles her in the barn. Honestly, right... <sighs> My stomach just dropped at this scene here. This is an innocent mother. A child has been taken from her and in an attempt to rescue the child, Fran stabbed her, chained her up in a secluded barn and removed her eyes and voice box. Two of her senses have just been severed. The AC cable's just been ripped out the back of the TV. Blackout. She can't navigate her way to safety. She can't scream for help. And all oh my days, listen to this. You can hear the desperation in her attempts as a mother who has lost her son. The horror is exaggerated here before we see another jump in time and the boy is now grown up to which Fran has raised him like her own. He discovers the mother in the barn, oblivious to the fact that it's actually his biological mother who Fran's kidnapped about eight years ago. There's a scene where she crawls from the shadows and growls at him and scuttles along the floor on all fours and understandably, he just bolts out the door. Fran has demonized this mother against her own son and she can't communicate the truth to him. As mentioned at the beginning of the video, the film comes full circle and it's the captured mother of the boy who is found lying in the middle of the road. There is justice at the end though as the police raid Fran's house and a gunshot can be heard. This suggests that the mother got away and found a way to communicate to the police what had been going on. But again, Pesk is consistent with this approach to not showing the climax of the build-up as the camera cuts away for a final time to the sound of a single gunshot. 
Well, this was my first nightmare fuel back in a while, and I think I need another six months off, to be honest. This was a horrific watch. When I thought not much more could phase me within the horror space, I was slapped with this across the face. Absolutely brilliant stuff. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and a comment down below if you agreed or disagreed with any of my comments. We're well on our way to 35k, so please join us in our search towards that target. As always, I've been your host, Hugh, from Unleash the Ghouls, and see you next time for another dose of Nightmare Fuel.